Hi everyone, I hope you can see me and hear me. It's now six o'clock in the UK time and then we would like to begin um, Japan Foundation event right now. But first of all, I like to be like a British, um, just talking about weather. Um, today it's London and uh, has um, had a very glorious day. It's very unlike, you know, British, British weather, but I mean, it's very shame to sort of stay at home. But, uh, you know, here we are, um, we are sort of offering that, um, you know, great um, talk event. My name is Junko Takekawa, Senior Arts Program Officer of Japan Foundation London. It has been for five months since the lockdown was imposed in the UK. Why is in lockdown is gradually introduced in England and the museum galleries such as Tate and the V&A have started to open their doors to visitors once again with caution. It is definitely true that deprivation of opportunity of seeing treasure live was one of the big issues and those witness collections are no exception. Under such circumstances, it is my great, great, great pleasure in inviting five curators from museums and galleries in England where lockdown is rapidly easing. Running now is the speaker's brief biography. As you see, no representative from London. This was our deliberate decision to focus on those institutes outside London, given that traveling is quite restrictive at the moment and not many people know there are also great treasures up and down England. Of course, during the lockdown or even before that, many institutes had been making great effort in engaging with people and introducing their collections online for pleasure, as well as educational purposes. We are not going to replicate th their efforts here. Instead, we would like to offer you another kind of treasure hunt led by these curators, who will introduce some of their favorite works selected not on the basis of, of that their institutional policy or certainly, certainly value for the works, but based on the charm of the object and the personal attachment. So you may be able to encounter something you have never expected. I'd like to thank our speaker, Kate, Janet, Rosie, Rachel, and Claire for joining us. Please note that due to timing issues, Rosie's presentation is a recording. Also, I'd like to thank Yoshimiki, an independent curator and researcher based in the United States, for moderating today's session. From museum to manor house and castle, Yoshi has been driving around the UK to check Japanese collections in hope that he and his team can help cataloging and share in many ways the outcome of their research to the benefit of the general public. As an organization which raised some concerns about literally hidden, and forgotten Japanese collection uh, treasures in the UK a while back. We are very grateful that Yoshi has followed up our concerns with unreserved passion and efforts. Today, that's, uh, today's event will be recorded. We, as we are using the webinar function, your name will not be viewable by other attendees. However, I strongly recommend keeping your audio muted and the video off throughout just in case. If you have any questions for the speaker, please use the Q&A function to send in your question at any time. You will see that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen of the Zoom. And then this question will be seen by everybody else. So, press by the button which you would like to, or if it is the same as yours, by clicking the thumb up icon next to the question. Lastly, as always, we will send you an online questionnaire, so please spare a short moment to complete it for a future event. Thank you for joining us once again. I hope you enjoy that, um, this kind of treasure hunt. So um, I'll hand it over to Yoshimiki to start the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Junko. Hello, I'm Yoshi Miki, the National Museum of Japanese History. I'm talking from my home in suburb of San Francisco, California. It is now 10 a.m. It will be sunny in the afternoon as usual. That's all we got. But today is a special day. 
I'm very excited to be able to listen to four distinguished curators talk about their favorite artifacts. And I am so glad that you are able to join us. Before we begin, I'd like to talk a little about the Japanese collections in the UK. I am fortunate to be able to research some of them for the past 10 years. I've spent time in Wales, Ireland, and even Orkney Island in Scotland. Believe me, there's a beautiful artifacts in Orkney Island. This country is a treasure house for Japanese artifacts. Many of them are there for a long, long time. Some are considered as local treasure. You may already know, but there is a book, A Guide to Japanese Art Collection in the UK by Mr. Greg Arvine, BNA. He said that what has come out of all this research is that there are at least 150 institutions or more in the UK that have collections of Japanese art. This book is my treasure. I read it over and over. It inspired me. It made me visit the places. And look what I found. I found more Japanese collections which were not on the list. Mr. Arvine was right. I am sure there will be more Japanese collections and then you may be able to find the one too. Wherever you visit, you should be able to find Japanese artifacts in the local museums, castles, or houses. I encourage you to look for Japanese collection. If you don't see it in the gallery, just emphasize your wish. I like to see more Japanese collection. It is important to display them in public in order to raise the profile of the collection locally. We, the curators, always like to hear from you what you think of the display. The four curators you will be hearing today make the great effort to make it public. There's one thing I learned through the research. Each object has a unique story to tell. There's always a story behind the artifacts. It may relate to the collector or even the local history. And I particularly like to know how these artifacts were loved by locals. When I study object, I look for the story, how this object became the part of the collection. Then I share the find outs with people around. I had an opportunity to co-curate a special exhibition, Kizuna Japan Wales Design at the National Museum of Wales in 2018 after I spent six years researching Japanese collections throughout Wales. I remember the vividly the moment I first saw a large lacquered box called copper in a dark corner in the long gallery at the Chalk Castle. Not so many people paid attention to it. After the research, we figured out when and how this artifact was brought into the castle in mid Wales. It was in mid 17th century by the owner who was happened to be one of the founder of the East India Company. We shared the history with visitors, then displayed it in the Kizuna exhibition. The Kofa got out of the castle for the first time in nearly 400 years. People are fascinated. They realized that this Japanese object is a part of the Welsh history. If you have a chance to visit the Chalk Castle, the Kofa is now sitting on a special podium and gets all attention from visitors because of the history. It is essential to raise the profile of the Japanese collection in public. I never got tired of researching them because I'm learning the history of the UK through Japanese objects. There may be a similar or exact the same object in Japan, US, or the other part of Europe, but this one is special because they are loved by locals. So, well, let's find out what's in there. 
The first speaker is Kate. Kate Newman, I'm sorry, Kate Newnham is the curator of visual art at the Bristol Museum and Art Gallery. Kate? Hello, good evening. Well, hello everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today or this morning or this evening or whatever time it is for you. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of the uh, very nice Japanese objects in our collection at Bristol. So Bristol is about an hour and a half from London by train in the west of England. Um, we have a huge encyclopedic collection, but also a very lovely collection of about 1200 Japanese objects, which are much loved by local people. Uh, Yoshi mentioned that, and I think it's always important to remember the audiences. So my first favourite object is this beautiful print by the artist Katsukawa Shuncho, showing the actor Segawa Kikunojo III in the role of Fox or Kiku. And what I love about this print is for a start, I think the colours, my favourite colour is orange and this is a very orange print and the orange is set off magnificently by the black printing. But then also the elegant posture of the actor um, and Segawa Kikunojo's father was a choreographer and learnt uh, and, and so I think learnt from his father some wonderful moves. Um, he was said by his fans to, to be able to hold a pose perfectly for just the right amount of time. One fan described his performances as dripping with moisture. So he was very erotic in the way that he played women, uh, which is, is really interesting. The other thing I like about this print is the, all the seasonal references in it. So it's a harvest scene and to the left of the actor you can see some ripening ears of rice and to the right, the, the dark orange patch to his right, is um, a stook of rice straw which has just been harvested. And then uh, if we think for a moment how people would have known, or how do we know who this image represents? The only inscription on it is the little inscription in the lower right of the image, uh, which gives the name of the artist, Shunsho. So how do we know that this is the actor Segawa Kikunojo III? Well, for Kabuki fans at the time, they would have instantly known that the circular device family crest that you see on his sleeve was the family crest or mon of the Segawa line of actors. So they would know instantly and there would only be one um, at any time with this particular um, name of Segawa Kikunojo. If we look at, um, on the next image we can look at the look at it in a bit more detail it's one of about 117 prints that was bought in 1963 by bristol museum from the wonderfully named professor crundell punnett and uh, crundell punnett was a geneticist from the university of cambridge who was collecting from at least the 1910s collecting japanese prints his original collection he sold to the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, where it forms the nucleus of the Japanese print collection there. So this group of prints that he owned um, that's now in Bristol is a sort of sister collection to that at the Fitzwilliam Museum. Looking at it, the image in, in a bit more detail, um, I think one of the fascinating things about Japanese prints is how many layers of meaning there are in them. And it's almost as if they are puzzles for us to unpick and work out. 
and I'm sure that's one of the things that attracted uh, people at the time who collected them in the seven, something like this in the 1780s, but also um, collectors more recently as well. Let's look at some of the details. So can you see that the actor has just bent his hand over in this seemingly innocent uh, sort of gesture here? Well, to Kabuki actors, to Kabuki fans of the time, this would be a moment of huge excitement because it would be when the character Okiku, um, a serving woman, was transforming into a fox and this this posture of the uh, the bent hand is rather paw like and it's showing this exciting moment when the the kabuki fans would see a character transforming in front of their eyes and this is the very moment that the artist chose to to save and immortalize here another detail uh, if we look on the black kimono of the actor, we can see this gorgeous pattern of orange uh, circular flowers, um, which represent chrysanthemums. And the, this is a sort of a reference to the autumnal scene, but also to the name of the character. And the character, as I mentioned, is Okiku and Kiku is the Japanese word for chrysanthemum. So we have a clue there in uh, the actor's kimono as to which role uh, we are seeing in front of us. Another detail, if we look at the sash um, that she's wearing, the obi, oh sorry, he uh, is wearing the obi sash, you can see how this circular orange motif here is rather discolored. And that is because this colour, the dark orange, was originally um, red lead. And this lead, um, or tan as it's called in Japanese, uh, would or does discolour um, on exposure to impurities in the air or impurities in whatever the print is housed in. So that leads me to, to just discuss the fact that whatever we're looking at is not exactly what the original owner of this print would have looked at. The colours are quite faded probably or they may have changed and discoloured like the red lead here. So probably the, um, the kimono layers that you see on the upper part of the actor's body would have been much brighter red originally, um, made from an extract of a flower, um, the uh, safflower, or beni in Japanese, and the sash, it looks grey now, but it may have been a beautiful, quite bright blue to begin with. So this orange that I'm in love with may have been much brighter and, and more striking, even a bit garish when the print was first uh, produced. But the final thing I want to look at on this particular object is this strange little board that we see and the the character seems to be looking down at this board what is it what are these six white strips suspended from the board and i'm sure a lot of you will probably guess this or you may guess this so i was trying to work out what it was and i was thinking is this some sort of Shinto kind of uh, paper decoration to indicate the the preciousness of this rice field but I think what it may in fact be is a trap for the fox and it's also a clue perhaps for the Kabuki fans at the time that this image is relating to the play Tsuri Gitsune Hana no Kake wana. So the first word there, tsurigitsune, means fishing for foxes. So here the, the character of the fox is looking down at this bait and it's making her turn into a fox or tur him turn into a fox. So what is this bait? Now you will probably know lots of things that foxes like but I wonder if it is fried tofu. So apparently foxes 
love fried tofu so perhaps the clever farmer has put some fried tofu out as a bait to see if he can flush out one of these shape-shifting cunning foxes who turns into women and uh, turns into a woman and turns back again but i think you know we're getting into japanese folklore here in this print as well so it's got so many interesting levels to it and i know that our audiences absolutely loved finding out about these japanese prints and loved hearing about the techniques that went into printing these as well moving on to my next object this is a glass tea caddy by Ida Mino, who's a contemporary artist. It's a tiny little thing about 12 centimetres high, made of different layers of glass, sandblasted and carved through to create this beautiful floral design. And one of the luxuries and, and privileges of, of being a curator is that often we're able to meet individual artists um, hear about their work see how they make things and it's very very inspiring um, and i collected that uh, tea caddy about three years ago when i visited japan uh, thanks to an art fund jonathan ruffer curatorial grant i was able to visit the izu peninsula which is about three hours from tokyo part of Shizuoka Ken um, and this peninsula which is very popular with tourists is made largely of this very white silica rich felsic rock um, that was used for about 50 years to make glass in the area. Now in 1989 when the glass making industry finished the local government decided to set up this museum to commemorate the glass making in the area and they call it a Koga Nizaki Crystal Park and it's curated um, by a wonderful lady called Sakuma Akio-san um, who is devoted to glass in all its forms and extremely knowledgeable and I was very lucky that she introduced me to uh, some local glass artists and this on the right is Ida Mino and on the left her partner Tsuji Shingo and they run uh, their own glass making workshop um, not far from the museum. They're there because the local government gave grants to contemporary artists, uh, glass artists about 20 years ago to set up their workshops to kind of create a local new glass making industry. Um, and they have the most wonderful workshop in a very, very quiet and beautiful part of the Izu Peninsula. Um, Ida-san makes these beautiful layered pieces. She's from a very creative family. Her mother is a textile artist, her father an advertising designer, her sister an illustrator. Uh, but um, Ida-san decided she would really like to work in glass as her as her artistic endeavor and she was inspired for a start by seeing the work of René Lalique the French um, Art Nouveau glassmaker who of course himself was very influenced by Japanese um, design so she loved the the natural motifs in Lalique's work so just to give you an idea of how she makes the pieces first she blows the pieces in the furnace and you can see a gather of glass here on the blow pipe her husband uh, is working there uh, in the background and then she um, puts uh, in the furnace she adds different layers of glass one over the other once the glass piece is cold and this happens very slowly she starts to make the design and she uses a kind of adhesive from the car industry to mask off areas of the glass and then sandblasts them and and then gradually removes the adhesive and cuts away and adds further details with the hand grinder so the result um, uh, she sells either locally in department stores or even uh, through Instagram and I'm always interested to, to hear about the whole process of how artists market their work and how they make a living. 
Um, going back to her little tea caddy, you can see that as you turn it round, you see different flowers. And these are all flowers that Idasa encounters um, on the um, Izu Peninsula where she lives. So in a way, although these two objects are divided, the, the, the print and, and this little tea caddy are divided by hundreds of years, they still have a, a very lovely link um, in their fascination with nature that we can all appreciate today. Um, so that's all I wanted to let you know today, but I hope you will come to Bristol Museum sometime. We're trying to put as much as we can online. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, both uh, Katsukawa Shinsho's and then Ida Minosan's are uh, beautiful. I love it. So it was very nice to see the, their artifacts, even through the, uh, the screen. And then you said you like orange on the print. Yes. I love black. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and bo both uh, Shinsho's prints and then uh, Ida Minosan's uh, uh, grass has a black. And mm -hmm. it is just stunning. Um, I really like. Do you collect more contemporary objects these days? Or what kind or how you, you manage that? Yes, uh, wherever possible, uh, we try to collect contemporary what works by contemporary artists. And that's because we don't, you know, we have wonderful historic collections in the museum, mm -hmm. but we don't want our visitors to think that Japanese culture finished in 1900. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we want people to understand that there is a hugely vibrant artistic scene um, happening in Japan and with Japanese artists around the world. So um, I have bought uh, contemporary Japanese prints um, and glass, in particular glass, because we have a very uh, good Chinese glass collection actually, um, uh, with some wonderful layered Chinese glass. So Ida San's work really spoke to me because of the her use of layers in glass. Uh, but but also I sometimes collect quite ephemeral pieces so that can connect with our historical collection. So for example, um, uh, biscuits, Hello Kitty biscuits for oh. The Girls' Day Festival, <laughs> uh, because and lots of Girls' Day Festival um, ephemera because we have some wonderful Girls' Day Hinamatsuri sets in the collection in Bristol. Okay, well, thank you very much, Kate. I will see you later. Okay, pleasure. Okay, so next um, will be um, Rosie uh, Gnatiuk, curator of costume at the Manchester uh, Art Gallery. Um, she is going to join us um, on video. Um, she's away, but uh, she um, made a nice video for us to talk about um, the fashion. Um, Rosie? Hello, my name is Rosie Gnatiuk and I'm costume curator at Manchester Art Gallery and I am really delighted today to tell you a little bit more about one of my favourite fashion designers and one of my favourite pieces in the costume collection. So this particular piece by Yoji Yamamoto we were very fortunate to be able to acquire through the National Lottery Heritage Fund Collecting Cultures Grant. We acquired not only this piece but a capsule collection of really iconic uh, couture garments that really represent important moments in fashion design history and I really believe that this piece by Yoji Yamamoto does just that. So we'll show you um, another few images throughout this film um, but for now I'll just give you some background about Yoji Yamamoto the fashion designer. So he was born in 1943 in Tokyo and rather brilliantly um, and rather lovely that his way into um, fashion design was through developing his tailoring skills when he used to help out in his mother's dressmaking business. He then went on to study fashion design at Bunker Fashion College when he graduated in 1969 and then he first debuted in Paris in 1981. 
So he has had an incredibly long career and that is absolutely because of the way he approaches fashion design and the fashion industry. He was doing something very different. He didn't conform. He didn't follow trend. Um, he wasn't, he was interested in kind of challenging the conventions of fashion. And this was absolutely shown in his choices of fabrics, the way he constructed clothing, um, in his avant-garde tailoring, in his complex layering. Um, and I think what's great about this piece um, is it really does encompass all of those ideas. So this dress is an autumn winter 95 catwalk piece and it has such a striking silhouette. It's created from this wonderful, really heavy um, wool tweed in a rusty red with a blue fleck through it. And it has this very striking, you're immediately sort of hit with this very striking shape of the bustle, which is a wonderful reference to the Victorian bustle dresses of the 1870s. And I think the most interesting thing, it's certainly what draws me to this piece, is the way that it offers you little clues as to how it's made and how it's constructed. So much of what's happening on the inside is revealed and made a feature of on the outside. And this is very typical of his work. So you have exposed but bound seams and then you have raw edges and you even have some of the... Um, the underpinning revealed where the bustle is, is kind of held. Now, one time I remember we had a study session with students from Manchester Fashion Institute and they all gathered around this particular garment and are, you know, so interested in how it was made and, you know, completely blown away by it really. And that for me was, was a really important moment because as a student myself studying fashion design in the, late 90s to see something that would have inspired me and still does to see the students having that connection with it and learning from it and really studying this piece to enable them to kind of develop their own approach to fashion you know was was a really great moment and i'm absolutely delighted that we will in future in the new fashion gallery at manchester art gallery be displaying um this piece by Yoji Yamamoto alongside the other acquisitions from the Collecting Cultures Grant. Many thanks. Oh, thank you, Rosie. Um, I don't think it's fair to ask her question, so we'll move on. Next uh, would be uh, Janet Boston, her Rosie's colleague, curator of crafts and design at the Manchester Art Gallery. Uh, Janet, you want to uh, introduce us the show I saw a few years ago. It was a beautiful exhibition about contemporary Japanese art and craft and fashion. So uh, next, Janet, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Yoshi. I'll just share my presentation with you now. Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'm Janet Boston from Manchester Art Gallery and um, I've selected a couple of items to show you from our extensive collection of craft and design at uh, Manchester Art Gallery. Um, the collection includes ceramics, glass, metalwork, furniture, lighting and costume. And this evening I'll be talking to you about two pieces that I've selected from the ceramics and the glass collections respectively. They're both contemporary pieces and they're by makers who were born in Japan but came to the UK to study their respective crafts and are now based here. So something that both pieces have in, in, in common is that they push the boundaries of the materials which the designer makers work with. So I show you the first piece and this is by 
Ikuko Iromoto, spiky, spiky bowl, so spiky she named it twice. And this piece is showing how Ikuko is inspired by natural forms and particularly botanical and animal forms viewed through a microscope. microscope. And she talks about her influences of being a world of intricacy and detail, mathematical pattern and organic chaos, of beauty and repulsion. And I think you can really see that in, in, in this piece. And um, it, it appeals to me because I love things that kind of draw from natural forms. And I kind of wondered why that was. And I read somewhere that the reason is that all natural things have a sort of underlying geometry to them that our brains kind of pick up on in a subconscious way. And it creates a kind of feeling of well-being because we recognise those those kind of harmonies created by the structures. So it's a really nice sort of um, idea. So this piece is kind of very beautiful, but it's also quite disturbing in a way because it's spiky, and I like that tension between the two. Um, it's actually about seven and a half inches in diameter, nineteen point five centimeters and it's made of porcelain by hand so how it's made is that Ikuko makes every single spike individually molded between her fingers and then she slip casts the bowl form. Um, slip casting is a technique where you use plaster moulds and pour in liquid clay known as slip and the moisture is absorbed from the slip into the plaster mould and uh, eventually you get a, a, a bowl form in this case which emerges leather hard so the, the the ceramic is firm enough to stand up but still it's got enough give in it that she can punch holes through with a drill bit and then through each hole she inserts one of her porcelain spikes and uh, the, the porcelain spikes are then secured in place with liquid slip and the piece is turned upside down onto its rim to fire it. And um, during the firing process, because porcelain, although it's, it's an amazing clay for, for showing up detail and texture, it also shrinks um, considerably in the kiln. This is a really dangerous kind of part of, and risky part of the, the making. And a good percentage of what is fired comes out with shrinkage cracks so it's really kind of a, a risky moment in the making of the piece and one of the things that I really love about porcelain um, is, is the fact that there is that element of risk and the idea of the maker investing all of that time and the sort of tension of it um, so yeah it's 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 a very brave piece I think and really pushes the the delicate delicate um, purity of porcelain absolutely to its limit. I'll just show you a quick image of this piece as it was shown on display in our exhibition Modern Japanese Design. So if you look to the left hand side of the showcase and count three objects in, there's two black pieces um, by Junko Mori metal pieces and then the bowl is the third one in on the bottom shelf. You can just see it and you can see how it resonated with the other pieces that were on display, which I don't have time to talk about this evening, unfortunately. So I'm going to now talk about um, a piece uh, of glass from our collection. And um, it was interesting that Kate had also, Kate Newnham's also picked a piece of glass. And um, studio glass making actually only began in Japan from the mid 20th century. So it's not a traditional craft. And I think perhaps because of this, Japanese artists approach the medium with fresh perspectives and take a sort of really different view of glass from European makers, which is quite refreshing. So the piece I've selected is by Aiko Tani, who is um, based up in Sunderland and um, studied up at the University of Sunderland and completed her PhD there in 2014. And 
this piece is called Starry Night Trail. And it's a very, very open vessel form, as you can see, um, with a kind of landscape scene of a, a road running in a spiral sort of uh, format to make the vessel shape. And you can see a detail from the, the vessel of a little car traveling along the road. It's made of lamp worked glass and um, Tani was inspired to take up lamp working because she kind of wanted, she was inspired by her grandma's knitting back in Japan and she had this idea that she wanted to kind of knit glass into 3D. Knitting glass is not possible but lamp working was the, the best that she could, technique that she could kind of fulfill that kind of ambition with and it's a technique where rods of glass are heated with a blowtorch. Um, sounds very simple doesn't it but it's amazing to see with that very um, you know kind of basic sounding technique the sophisticated piece that um, Tani has made with it and particularly so because lamp working is not usually used for um, making sculpture it's used for making jewellery it's made, made for very very small miniature sculptural pieces and for lab glass and Christmas decorations, things like this. This piece is 12 inches or th tall or 30 centimetres um, high. Um, so it's a big piece and um, Tani worked on it for a month um, adding to it. And the thing about glass is it's a tricky medium because it is exceedingly temperature sensitive. You have to heat it up very gradually otherwise it will crack you have to cool it down very gradually otherwise it will crack and when you're making a piece with different elements in it like this the difference in temperature between the different parts of it can also cause cracks as well so it is a very temperamental kind of nail-biting kind of medium to work with and the sophistication of this piece the fact that she's actually attempted to draw it, it with glass is just quite mind-blowing um, and I, I had an email conversation with Tani about, uh, Aiko Tani about this piece and uh, she said the most difficult part of it was making the trail the sort of flattened ribbon and that kind of was, was kind of cracking during the making of it so that was, that was particularly stressful. So I want to just show you now, I've shown you this image of it, but I want to show you it as it was on display in the, um, in the exhibition and uh, you can see it was shown alongside um, another piece uh, by Ayako Tani and they just looked absolutely stunning they were lit from underneath in, in our showcase and they literally looked like drawings in light and I positioned these pieces at the at the beginning of the exhibition so that they were the first thing that visitors saw as they came in and it was just really lovely sometimes to kind of stand quietly in the gallery and hear people come in and gasp at them because they are absolutely exceptional and stunning and i'd just like to finish by by saying that um although they look incredibly delicate they're actually not as scary to to actually pick up and move as you would think they're made of a, a type of glass called borosilicate glass which is the same glass used in in pyrex cork wire so it has a quite a high tensile strength so it is actually stronger than it looks so um they're not as scary to move as you think but um, I, I, I feel really lucky that I'm privileged enough to be able to handle these beautiful objects so I'd like to finish on that note thank you thank you Janet um, I love the way you described how to how that uh, spiky spiky was made that was very educational, so I like it. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned that uh, you and the Manchester Art Gallery collect the works by artists, Japanese artists who are trained in the UK or Europe. And then um, are you um, intend to continue to collect these art and uh, works? 
and yes. I, I and I'm sorry, I'm going to do this um, interrupt, <laughs> but um, I, I like I said, I love the show. You you show the picture. The, when I was there, I was just stunning, and then I just enjoyed being there uh, a lot. So anyway, I saw you. Um, what's the policy of collecting these the works by Japanese artists who are trained in Europe? And also, that you try, uh, are you intend to continue to uh, collect these of the uh, artwork? Well, our policy is to collect items of craft and design that show the mastery uh, uh, of material and also show innovation in craft as well, sort of technical innovation or innovation in concept. And consistently, Japanese makers do do both of those things so that is why we would collect Japanese yeah. craft it's not because it's Japanese but because of its its quality purely um, yeah and no, no doubt about it Japanese crafts people are absolutely at the forefront in, in, in craft internationally when I was there the lots of art students were sitting on the floor I just keep looking at the object it was wonderful well thank you very much Janet um, Thank you. We'll move on. Um, before I move on, I, I, I just wanted to, to tell you that um, uh, the lots of chat is coming in and then I'm focusing on to, to be a moderator so I don't have much time to respond but uh, uh, it's great to, to uh, see people are responding and then kind of lively so I'll keep doing that and then I love to um, read later. Um, but thank you very much. So um, we move on and uh, next will be Rachel Berkeley, curator of the Oriental Art Museum, I'm sorry, Oriental Museum at the Durham University. So Rachel, you are. Thank up. you so much, Yoshi. Lovely. Right. I shall now try to share my screen with you all. This is always the interesting moment. Lovely. So hopefully you can now all see that. So um, first of all, just thank you um, to Yoshi for the introduction and um, thank you to Junko and the Japan Foundation for inviting me to join the evening. It's been really interesting so far. Um, as Yoshi said, I'm from the Oriental Museum in Durham uh, and our collections cover the whole of Asia and um, North Africa and we're best known for China and ancient Egypt and I'm actually an Egyptologist by training, so get easy with, with me on the really difficult Japanese questions. Um, but when I came to the museum 13 years ago, the Japanese collections had really been, um, to be honest, quite sort of ignored because the other two collections were so well known. So I uh, undertook an audit of all the Japanese collections ahead of us creating a new Japan gallery in 2013, which was one of those life-changing uh, experiences um, I met Yoshi through it um, at a Japan Foundation event actually and we have become friends um, and um, uh, now have a, a working partnership which we'll, I'll talk about a bit later. Um, but I just, I, yeah, I developed a passion for Japanese art and culture um, which has really driven me um, for the last few years um, to expand the Japanese collections, to uh, use them more, to display more of them. And it's been an enormously fun journey we have actually doubled the size of the Japanese collections in the time that I have been at Durham. We are perhaps best known for ceramics um, and um, we were lucky enough to acquire a very large ceramic collection um, in recent years. So it will probably come as a surprise um, to people who know me that I'm not going to talk about a ceramic. Um, the first object that I am going to talk to you about is a fan. Um, it's a quite a small fan, it's only 15 centimeters, um, made for a child. Um, it's paper with um, silver uh, and as you can see a, a lovely design of white flowers uh, with bamboo blades um, lacquered in red and slightly damaged at one end uh, and as you can see the silver has tarnished quite badly and that is why I love this fan because in the tarnish hopefully you can see many fingerprints and these are fingerprints of one or more children. Uh, and we think it's these young ladies. So these are the Squire sisters, Dorothy and Marjorie. Uh, and I love these photographs of them um, that were taken during their time in Japan. The one in particular I love is with their 
um, young Japanese friend. It reminds me of the kind of photographs my parents used to try and take of me when we were children, that we were having too much fun to actually pose. Um, but you will see there are fans in both photographs, unfortunately not this fan. Um, but I absolutely love this pair. Their father, uh, George, travelled out to Japan in 1898. He came from Lancashire, from a papermaking family, uh, and went out to Kyushu to um, be general manager for a paper company uh, there. Four years later, he went back to the UK and brought back his wife and children, so 1902. Um, and Mrs Squire and the girls then spent five years in Japan with him. Because where they were, there were very few uh, Europeans. Uh, they made friends with the Japanese family, families locally, particularly those associated with the paper company. Mrs Squire had been a school teacher in the UK and so she taught the girls um, and she also taught a number of their friends, uh, their Japanese friends, English. Um, and I've always wondered, we don't know who the gentleman is in the other photograph, but he's holding this book and I've always wondered whether he is one of her star pupils from her English lessons. So the girls only spent five years out in Japan, but it clearly had a really lasting impression on them. They love Japanese art and culture for the rest of their lives, um, but unfortunately neither of them ever returned to Japan. And in 1973, um, Dorothy donated to the museum um, some of the family's collection. And I love the whole collection because it's not some sort of fancy art collection overall. It's, it's a family group of material. You can see their lives in Japan in this collection. So uh, the kimono that I've shown here, what you can't see is that Mrs. Squire has altered it to put very European darts in it so that it fits in a rather more European way than it was originally designed. We've got the girls' um, rag books with the stories. Um, the tea service I've always liked to imagine uh, Mrs. Squire using. Uh, and the gold pieces you can see at the bottom, those are actually cufflinks. So beautiful gold lacquered cufflinks, um, presumably made for Mr. Squire so that he could um, continue to dress in a British style but have a Japanese um, hint to it. So most of the collection, I say, came into this in 1973, but Dorothy kept a small number of the objects back until her death. And those came into us as a bequest in 1986. And the fan is one of those pieces. Unfortunately for us, uh, curators at the American Museum at that time, and I have to say it's a, a general thing, we're not very good at asking about the stories. We were very happy to take your objects, but we weren't doing enough to ask about the stories behind them. So we don't know what made this fan so special to Dorothy. Why did she keep this one um, rather than giving it in 1973 with the others? I like to imagine um, that it's because it had special memories for her that it reminded her of a special occasion. Um, you can imagine the girls being given these wonderful new fans and the beautiful silver finish uh, and being told to behave um, at some special event and then being unable to resist putting their fingers all over them. Um, so I love that idea, we'll never know, but it's nice to think about. Um, but it's also nice to have that traces of the donor, um, that Dorothy and Marjorie are there with us still in the fan and there's a little bit of them still in the museum. One of the other things um, that the family did give to us as part of the 1973 donation were two albums of prints by the artist Chikonobu. Uh, so one album of single um, sheet prints, um, classic Shinbijin, beautiful ladies, um, and one album of triptychs, uh, one of uh, Chikonobu's um, albums of, of Tokugawa ladies. Um, and uh, these are really popular with visitors. Whenever we put them on display, as you can see, the colours are still fantastic. They've been really well cared for by the family and they're enormously popular. So one of the things that I've done over recent years is to try and collect more pieces by Chikonobu to um, show the range of his work. And in particular, we'd collected a few of his pieces um, that show the, the, the Meiji Emperor and the Imperial Court, which are obviously quite different to these more traditional images. So it was extremely exciting to me when at the end of 2018, we were offered a wonderful collection of uh, Japanese prints that included some Chikonobu pieces, which takes me on to my second object of the evening, um, this amazing print. Uh, so we can see here uh, Katakiyomasa, 
um, facing off, he is on the, I always have to get this right, he's on the right, uh, facing off against Honda Tadakatsu, who is in the center. I hope I've got that right. Yes, I have. Um, at the Battle of Komaki. And this is part of the famous story uh, where um, Tadakatsu um, uh, and his massively outnumbered um, band hold off um, Toyotomi's um, troops um, so that um, Tokugawa Ayesu can um, as a, you know, leave the battlefield. Um, but what I love about it is the two of them focused in together. And um, so if we kind of get rid of the words and focus in on the print, you've got these two um, soldiers facing off against one another. They're so focused on one another, everything else disappears into the background. And one of the things I love the most is how the smoke and dust of battle is represented not by colour but by the absence of colour and um, just leaving the paper um, to give us that impression and how everyone else recedes into the background while the two focus on each other. The colours are wonderful, the whole structure of the piece is fantastic. But the reason this one has become particularly special um, I will explain in a moment and um, perhaps give a little bit more background on the collection in general though. Um, John Scott, um, the collector, came late to Japanese prints. Uh, he had collected European art for much of his life, but having seen an exhibition at the Barbican, uh, and then interestingly, a catalogue from Boston on their postcard collection, uh, he developed a passion for Japanese prints. And as you can see from this range of prints in the collection, this is not the beautiful ladies uh, uh, that we have seen before. What he got interested in was stories. Um, and so you can see a scene here from the Soga Brothers, there's another one here from the Eight Dog Tales, um, but as well as the fictional stories, also um, stories of heroes, of battles, um, of all those sort of um, historic uh, events like the one we've just seen, but also um, Meiji era, um, the Meiji era wars, the Sino-Japanese war and the Russo-Japanese war. So the drama of all of these stories um, both real and imaginary is the thing that really appealed to him and that's been fantastic to add that to the collection in contrast with the kind of material that we have elsewhere in the collection. Which is why it was really rather devastating that the exhibition we had been working on with um, Yoshi and his colleagues at the National Museum of Japanese History, which was due to open this May, uh, did not open due to the shutdown for COVID. Um, it's a fantastic collection and it's been a lovely project to work on. Um, with Yoshi, the plan had been it would be part of the season of culture for the Olympics. Um, and of course, all of those plans have changed. But I think for me, the reason the print has become so important, so iconic, is it's that battle. Um, and to me, this image has become about the battle we are currently locked in uh, with the virus uh, and that we will not be defeated by it. Um, so yes, uh, things have changed, uh, we're having to look at the schedules, we'll have to look at budgets. Life is very, very strange at the moment, but I am quite determined that this exhibition will happen um, and that you will get a chance to see this print and all of the others um, in real life. And I think as, as, as the other curators have talked about, it's fantastic to have you all here online and to be able to talk about what we do and what we love. Um, but it will be even better when we can get you back into the museum um, and you can see these things sort of in the flesh, so to speak, and see all of the details and really take the time to enjoy all of these pieces. So I think that's really where I want to finish in sort of saying to you that, yeah, for me, this picture has become about how we will not be defeated and we will be back and we will do this exhibition. Um, and I look forward to welcoming as many of you as possible to it and to continuing to work with Yoshi and his colleagues uh, in developing it. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I'm moved. <laughs> <laughs> so the fingerprints. Yes. Oh, well, that, that's what I was talking at the beginning. It just, you know, it shows how the artifacts were, was loved by the owner or sister, well, this time, the, on this case, sisters. And then um, I've seen several of the artifacts you show me, but um, I never connected the dots. 
And then um, that's a story I like, I'm, I'm sure people love to hear. And any plan to make that kind of someday exhibit about the sisters collection? I would love to. Yes. Yeah. I, I as you know, I love the, the, the stories behind objects and the Squire sisters, I think, are two of my favorites. Um, interestingly, when I first arrived at the museum, the collection was referred to as the George Squire collection uh, for the father, but the, the, the objects were given by the, the, the daughters um, and it's really their story. And you can see in the objects, you know, we have things like their dolls and the books and things. So I really want to talk about them. And we do have those lovely photographs to go with it and other documents to go with it. So yes, when we've done the Japanese print exhibition, we'll do the Squire Sisters exhibition together. Oh, we would love to share this story with the visitors. Yeah, someday. Thank you, Rachel. You're very welcome. Okay, and the final um, presenter is uh, Claire Pollard, uh, the curator of Japanese art at the Ashimori Museum in Oxford. Hi there. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here this evening and, and to join you all. Um, let me see if I can now share my presentation. Um, is that working? Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, good, 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 good. Okay, so um, yes, uh, I'm the curator of Japanese art at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Um, that's the um, Oxford University Museum of Art and Archaeology, and we're the oldest public museum in the country. I think we opened in 1683, and there have been Japanese objects in the collection from the very beginning, um, although they've sort of added to the collection over the years, and we now have about 8,000 objects. And this photograph was taken just a few days ago. Um, we're gearing up to reopen to the public on the 10th, and we had a couple of trials days um, today and yesterday so we're all it's all very exciting anyway I will how do I get on to my next okay so um, the first of the two objects I've chosen is this beautiful little porcelain vase with a peach bloom glaze um, this is a, a glaze made from um, copper oxide that was originally developed in China but this piece um, was made by the Japanese potter Miyagawa or Makuzu Kozan um, at his workshop in Yokohama um, in around uh, 1890 um, or in the, perhaps a bit later. So this is, this is the, the potter Miyagawa Kozan um, and that's his Makuzu workshop in Yokohama. Um, and you can see that it, it is actually on display in the museum. Um, you can see it here right at the front of the case, but it's quite easy to overlook because it's tiny. It's only about six and a half centimetres tall. Um, and the reason, well, there are several reasons why it's one of my favourite objects in, in the collection, but um, perhaps the main reason uh, is that it represents the kind of the very beginning of my journey, I suppose you could call it, towards becoming a curator of Japanese art. Um, also, my very first association with the Ashmolean Museum, long before I began working there, I've been there about 14 years now, but it was many years before that, um, I was a graduate student at Oxford University um, back in the 1990s. Um, and in fact, I wrote my doctorate on Miyagawa Koza and this very Potter um, with the great um, curator and scholar, Dr. Oliver Impey, who was then the keeper of, of Japanese art at the museum. And, and here's Oliver in one of the old Chinese galleries. Um, I remember discussing with Oliver one day um, Miyagawa Kozan's amazing skill at producing ceramics of all different types, including um, Chinese style monochromes like this one, um, that was so good that he was actually accused of forgery by some critics at the time. Um, and Oliver joked that he thought that probably half of the museums um, in the world um, were hiding Makuzu porcelains in their Chinese collections. Um, and so I duly went off to check the Ashmolean Museum's Chinese um, porcelain store and lo and behold discovered two little vases, the, the one that I've, I've got here um, and um, one other one which is even smaller. Um, and as an aspiring student of Japanese art, it was a, a, a really exciting moment. I, it was the first time I actually felt that my, my research and my knowledge could actually have a, a practical a, a effect. So it was, it was really a kind of a landmark moment in my studies. Um, but the other reason that I, I, um, I love this little pot is that it has a lovely story. It's this idea of the story again. Um, it was presented to the Ashmolean Museum in 1956 um, as part of a, a large gift of objects um, Japanese and Chinese um, um, by Sir Herbert and Lady Ingram. 
Sir Herbert was the older brother of Collingwood Ingram, who was the great um, authority on Japanese flowering cherries, um, whose story has become quite well known recently because of the lovely book by Naoko Abbott. But Sir Herbert um, and Lady Ingram travelled to Japan on their honeymoon in 1908. Um, and I love and they bought this little pot there. And I, I, I love the idea that this has kind of got a, I don't know, it feels to me as if it's got quite a, a happy aura to it. Um, so this is them um, around the time they went to Japan. And then one of the photographs they took in Japan. Um, and along the bottom, I've just um, given a, 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 a sample of some of the types of objects they, they, they acquired while they were in Japan, because they stayed there for about three months, sightseeing and, and curio hunting. And thanks to the Ingram's granddaughter, Jackie Ingram, um, we have um, been given access to Sir Herbert Ingram's diaries. He kept meticulous records about um, the objects he bought with, with descriptions and details of where he bought them, how much they cost and so on. Um, so we know that this one he acquired in Tokyo for one yen and that he acquired it as a Chinese vase um, from the reign of the Emperor Qianlong, in other words, 18th century. So this relates back to my little student moment. Um, he thought it was a Chinese, Chinese vase. And um, this is despite the fact that the, the vase is clearly stamped on the bottom with the Makuzu studio mark. Of course, the Ingrams wouldn't have been able to read that, but the dealer who sold it to them certainly would have done. Um, and was clearly um, you know, trying to pull a fast one, although he only sold it to them for one yen, which is probably the price it would have, would have cost um, from the um, workshop in the first place. So you kind of wonder why he bothered. Um, but I, I, I just love knowing um, the details because it really kind of brings the object to life and it, it really weaves it, not just into the, the history of the Ingram family, but also into the Meiji um, collection, Meiji era, um, a little wider age Meiji era. It becomes so much more than just a, a little pot in a, a showcase. So that's my first object. And the second one is this fantastic, vibrant, evocative, funny, I think, woodcut called Clap by Naoko Matsubara, who is a Japanese artist who's been based in Canada um, since the 1970s. And here is Naoko Matsubara in her studio, which is in Oakville near Toronto. Back to Clap. Clap is from a series of woodcuts um, called In Praise of Hands, which was inspired by Naoko Matsubara's um, tiny baby, um, the exploring busy hands that he had when he was still just a few months old. Um, but over the years, um, from the beginning, she first started making these in 1973, but over the, the decades since, um, it's expanded into a much kind of wider exploration of, of human hands in, in general. So um, I feel this is a bit cheating because we were only supposed to choose two objects, but I've sneaked in a, a, a few more um, from the collection. So just to give you an idea of the, the range of hands, you have hands um, engaged in sports, in, in creative activities, um, all sorts really, dance, music, prayer, um, you name it. Um, and the, the, the oh, if I can go back to clap, oh, no, we're going too far. Let's go back, to, back here again. Um, clap was, um, the praise, uh, the series in general was given to us as, as um, part of a fantastic gift of over 100 works um, from the artist herself, um, presented at the Ashmolean in 2018. Um, and it's going to be the subject of a, a small exhibition I'm creating um, next spring. Um, it, it struck me actually when I was selecting these, or only after I selected these two objects, that they kind of top and tail my association with the Ashmolean over the past 30 years. It's interesting. But I've, I've chosen Clap, not just because I love it and the kind of the wonderfully joyful work of now called Matsubara in general, but because it really represents these past five months of lockdown to me, or at least a, a very positive side um, of what's been such a, a strange and an uneasy time. One of the great pleasures um, of the past few months has been working with Naoko Matsubara and also um, the very talented British poet Penny Boxall um, on a collaborative project around the series in Praise of Hands, which we're making into a book. So what we've done is Penny has responded to Naoko Matsubara's prints um, and then these will go into a book and I forgot to go back to that print, I, the picture I, I shared earlier. This is Penny with a, um, two of her poetry collections. Penny's poems, and I'll, I'll share with, one with you at the end, um, have a, a kind of 
clarity and playfulness and a, a range of mood and a, a, a kind of deceptive simplicity that really resonate um, with now, of course, woodcuts. Um, so it's, it's very exciting seeing them come together. Although we um, actually began the project a while ago, well before the pandemic, um, the subject of, of hands has taken on a, a new meaning somehow since then, the idea of touch and the absence of touch um, with social distancing and, and everything else. Um, and many of the individual prints have taken on a, a, a kind of new meaning as well, perhaps weren't there before. So if you think about healing hands or hands occupied in things, um, while they're not at the office or at school or whatever, or even hands deliberating on, on this sort of changed world that we find ourselves in. Um, and of course, hands clapping, perhaps in, in support of, of um, the people working to keep us safe. So I asked now Paul Matsubara whether th these clapping hands, which she created back in 1974, um, represented a, a specific um, moment. And she told me that they were really, um, they stood for clapping in general, kind of the essence of clapping. Um, she said that um, she and her husband um, loved to go and, and um, watch musical performances, dance performances, um, and really enjoyed clapping to show their appreciation. And she also said that she loves to clap as she dances and that she can clap really loudly. And I think you really get a sense of that um, in the woodcut, the kind of the, the joy and, and the appreciation in there. So when I look at it now, it really reminds me of standing on the street on a Thursday evening with the neighbours clapping in support of the NHS. But I know in the future there will be other layers of, of kind of emotion or experience that sort of come out of it. But I, I know that there will always be positive um, emotions. Um, I can't look at this print without smiling. So really for me, um, it represents the, the power of art to, to uplift and, and to comfort, I suppose. The very last print in the series um, was added this May during lockdown when now Cormac Sparrow invited Penny Boxall to write a new poem for which she would um, create a, a, another print, um, a brand new woodcut. Um, and this was right at the height of the, of the pandemic and um, there was something really wonderful about seeing something beautiful and new um, emerge in such a, a troubled world. Um, and despite basic practical obstacles, like now we're not being able to access the proper woodcuts and that sort of thing. Um, so I think it probably would be cheating to include that now. So I'm just going to invite you, please, to, um, to have a look at it in the book or even to come back to the museum to see it in the flesh. But I thought I'd just leave you with um, the, the, the woodcut again. Here's Clap with its poem. And I hope you can, you can read that on the right um, and see how they work beautifully together. Thank you, Claire. Uh, it was great to hear about your journey to become a curator and uh, your encounter with the, your mentors and uh, collectors. That's a kind of great story. I love to hear more. And um, um, so you received more than 100 prints um, by Naoko Matsuba, which yes. is my, my It was favorite. fantastic, wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful gift and we um, we've already um, had an exhibition called Lifeline celebrating the gift with a selection of other works. That's good, you know. I mean how's like working with live artists because most of the time I research people who made are already dead. <laughs> so, well yeah. it was it was a very that's a really interesting question because it was a, quite a new experience for me because nearly all the Yashmoni's yeah. collections are historical collections and I've only worked um on, on historical collections. So it was really interesting. You're kind of quite a um you know, very very challenging. You have to do it, you know, as a as a um, curator of historical objects, you have complete power, don't you? Whereas with an artist, it's much much more collaborative. Um, but very exciting because you you find something you know greater at the end. I think at the end of the process. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much again, Korea. Um, so uh, this time, I like to ask all the presenter to come back. Okay, um, well, again, thank you uh, all for the wonderful presentations. Crap, crap, crap.
uh, I love her work then, so it's a very special treat for me. Um, here, um, we have uh, this opportunity to talk about us, people, me, museum visitors, and the museum, um, next 10, 15 minutes. Um, we all are faced by the tremendous challenge, COVID-19 pandemic. Many of us are still working from home. I miss greeting visitors um, coming into gallery. And uh, we are facing the challenge to operate museum galleries under this uh, circumstance. Claire told me that um, in Oxford, the tourism is in summer is dead. And in the US, we were the opening museums, but now we are reclosing. It is tough. Um, I read the article on New York Times that the director of Whitney Museum of American Art saying that um, they're going to open the museum for the locals. It is usually packed by tourists, but their focus is now the people around the museum. Visitors um, like to spend time in the gallery looking at their favorite art. And Mr. Inoue, the deputy director of Tokyo National Museum, said in his videotaped gallery tour, which is online, uh, if you have a chance, um, it's a very moving. We, the curators, are not the essential workers, like doctors. Um, we cannot save people's life, but we can soothe the soul of visitors with artifacts. People would love to spend time in a gallery. So that's what we are facing right now. And then I would love to, to hear from all of you, Kate, Janet, Rachel, and Claire, um, the, uh, how the situation affects your work, any thoughts and anything you'd like to share with us. Um, can I start from the, the same order, Kate? Yes, sure. I mean, it has been a very strange time. Um, but what we've been doing in Bristol is to concentrate um, hard on getting as much content as we can online. So it's, it's quite an experimental time. So we've tried, um, well, we have online exhibitions anyway, but we've done more of those. We've do been doing regular online talks and our visitors really appreciate the opportunity just to see, um, well, to, to meet up and hear somebody talking live about the museum collections, which they're missing. But we've also done more experimental things such as um, community recipes on Instagram, dance sessions that relate to the collections. Um, but in Bristol, a, a kind of one unusual point, I suppose, was when the statue of Edward Colston was knocked down, we had a, an absolutely huge spike in visitors to our websites. Wow. So, you know, maybe 30,000 in, in 24 hours or something. So uh, lots of people started to look at our content or online in, in different ways. So. Um, that was just a kind of once in a career kind of moment for our websites. Uh, wow. But we, we hope to develop more uh, on our collections online. And I think as we've seen tonight with so many people joining from all around the world, you know, digital does offer us new opportunities that uh, are very interesting to explore. Um, but of course, nothing, nothing will replace entirely looking at the real object, which is uh, also what we have to balance. Yeah. Thank you. Janet, anything you'd like to share? Uh, we, we are reopening on the 20th uh, of August, so four days a week. So sort of... Ah. Kind of a, a kind of soft reopening as we kind of, we and visitors kind of work out what what this new kind of um, kind of visiting is going to be like with, under the cir current circumstances. Um, we have been doing a lot of events online and our sort of community programs have moved entirely online and we've been using online discussions 
as a means of sort of keeping up lines of dialogue. Um, we're also working on reinterpreting our permanent galleries at the moment and we decided that we definitely wanted to get our sort of introductory gallery open in time for the reopening on the 20th uh, of August so we're actually we're, we're installing that right now <laughs> my colleague well my colleagues are and we're we've been working on interpretation for that which has included zoom conversations so there'll be there'll be a screen showing the zoom conversation we've been working with friends and volunteers of the gallery and gallery staff to to interrogate the the objects that kind of form our collections and to ask questions like what is what is manchester art gallery where do its collections come from what what are they for and um, to look at a sort of much deeper and more philosophical way at, at, at our collections and also to look at it in terms of contemporary relevance as well so we'll be investigating themes of work and climate change as well those are sort of forthcoming galleries so looking at our existing collections but through a, a, a more contemporary lens uh, like you said it is our career moment yeah um, yeah. For even for us, uh, not only for visitors, but for us, um, how to operate the museum and how to greet visitors, because their expectations are totally different now. And the way they walk around the gallery will be different. So it is our moment and um, we need to face that challenge. So, so I agree. Well, thank you. Um, Rachel? Well, you talked about it, but um, yeah, anything you, you want to add? Um, yeah, uh, the first challenge for us, so yes, the exhibitions of 2021. Um, the university, um, being a university museum, the university has asked us to focus for now on our students. Um, obviously, most universities in the UK are anticipating that most, if not all, of their teaching will be online from October. Um, and having worked very hard over the last few years to get the museum involved in an awful lot of uh, courses and the whole point being on, you know, hands on, um, getting students actually working with the collections. We are currently um, wrestling with that. How do you take all of those courses where the whole point is that the student comes in and, and picks up the thing and gets to actually hold it. Um, so the university has made the decision to keep us closed to the public for now so that we can focus on supporting our students and working out how we can make the teaching happen. So even if they have to have their lectures online, we can create small group teaching in the museum and do things like that in October. So that is my um, current one, is how we get offline and back into the museum and get people getting their hands back on things in a safe way. That's the, the challenge for us in the next couple of months. Okay, Clea? Well, yes, as I said, we've actually had our first couple of days of, of trial run opening um, and opening properly next week. So we've got all the safety measures in place, all the, you know, the social distancing reminders and arrows on the floor and, and so on. Um, and it was quite interesting to see how people went into the museum. I think the people have made the commitment and prepared to take the risk to go into a museum. I think they probably want to see something really special. So um, just... I mean, it was only family and friends who were coming in today, but it was the special exhibition. We have the young Rembrandt on exhibition on at the moment, and that was what was really, really crowded. And I think that's something probably to, to kind of to think about. We need to really work hard to make the visitors' experience memorable and enjoyable and, and beautiful. And as curators, that's what we all do anyway. We try and do that at the best of times, but I think it's even more important to try and do that somehow or other. Um, and you know, also like museums everywhere, we've, we've been trying to to create our to create more in the way of online offerings. And you know, from uh, as Kate said, the traditional curator talks and, and and so on, but also more kind of light-hearted or um, slightly in more imaginative ways of, of engaging with the collection. So um, you know, we have one of the things that we did during lockdown was an isolation creations. Um, every day we had an, an object that people were invited to respond to. And that was lovely. Um, it included seven Japanese objects, but it was great because anybody could respond. There was no pressure to be, you know, a great artist, you could be an adult or a child or whatever. 
um, and we're doing other things at the moment. We're developing some mindfulness um, films. So it's a way of looking at objects in quite a different way, perhaps not the same analytical or conceptual way that we might normally think of talking about them, really focusing on a, on a more sort of visual way. Um, so yes, and we're also, it's also such an ongoing process because we don't know what's going to happen and, and scenarios keep changing. I mean, who knows, perhaps the, the restrictions will, will relax, perhaps they will be you know, made stricter again. Um, and we're, we're in the middle of an ongoing cross-museum brainstorming process, I think they call it ideation, which was a, a new word for me, but it's a, a way of really trying to imagine the whole visitor journey from even before they come to the museum, the way of getting hold of tickets, because of course everything has to be ticketed so we can control numbers, but you know, how they do that and, um, and then you know, how they get to the museum and how we make their, their experience better and then what happens afterwards. So, but that's sort of ongoing and we have to create um, best, best practice for different scenarios. So it's all, it's all up in the air and it depends on feedback and I think it will depend on, on, on what happens when we reopen. Korea. Well, you can tell we are so passionate about opening the museum. We're welcoming uh, you to the museum, so that I can tell that, that you are ready to 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 face the, all the challenges. Um, I don't know how long we can continue. Um, because it's been almost a year and an hour and a half. So um, the be before uh, clear, be uh, clear before you go, uh, there's a question from uh, the. The some uh, the I forgot the name. Anyway, um, someone wants to know the title of the poetry you um introduced. Oh, the book is going to be called In Praise of Hands, which is the the title of of Naoko Matsubara's um woodcut series. Um, so yes, and 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 Penny's poems will yeah that that's also the the title of her series I suppose. So it's In Praise of Hands, and mm. and we should be publishing that in in October we hope. Okay, thank you. And then the, someone also asked me about the book, the a guide to the Japanese art collection in the UK, which is published by Japan Society. So um, if you uh, go into the Japan Society website, I think it's it's not a new book, but um, I'm I'm pretty sure they have good stock. But anyway, so um. Well, um, there are lots of um, the chat and there are lots of um, the messages um, to us. It's wonderful, and then we'll, I will go through later. Um, but it's been an hour and a half, so I think I will turn to Junko-san um, to uh, end the session. Junko-san. Yes, thank you so much. I'm I'm pretty I'm very very sorry that we couldn't actually uh, give any opportunity to answer the question that uh, gathered together for the Q&A patterns because um, I was overwhelmed by the passion uh, of the each speakers. They are just so passionate about their collection, which is a great sign. Although museums and galleries in the UK are gradually opening, they are struggling to accommodate the visitor at full scale. Um, they will need support, uh, like other sectors, in order to keep collections safe. I hope this event provides a new insight in Japanese collections and I hope one day, as everybody actually cited, that you'll be able to see them in the flesh. I think it's the experience in the museum is the most important. It's, it's, it's not be compensated by just watching that uh, collection online. I'm sure of that. I mean, this is also through my experience visiting the Merchants Art Gallery, Oriental Museum, Ashmorean, and Bristol Museum, all great museums, in all great museums scattered around in, in the UK. So I really want to encourage everybody, once that uh, cor the coronavirus is subsided, hopefully it, it is happening soon, to visit those museums and immerse that great treasure in you know, by themselves. So thank you so much for your passionate presentation. So although that uh, people cannot hear that um, that's a clapping noise from audience, but I just see you not doing that on behalf of them. So you can feel that um, our gratitude to, towards you. So thank you all speakers and thank you Miki-san and thank you for all of you who attended this you know, event. I appreciate great a lot. So that's all from Japan Foundation. And then I hope that uh, you have that uh, nice rest of the evening. Thank you so much. See you again. Thank you.